Welcome to the Realm Walker podcast, where we discover the many similarities and differences in races, aspects, and world building of our favorite fantasy and sci-fi universes. Whether it's a simple walk to Mordor or at high speeds across the galaxies, I'm your host, Jake, and I am joined by my crew members, Ethan. I just got back from a wonderful trip in the grimdark setting. Um, Don't go there on a Tuesday. Don't recommend it, everyone. And we are also joined with CJ. One of the biggest Dunmer fans you will ever find. Everyone laugh at him. Yes, everyone laugh. So, as as this is the first episode, this is going to be uploaded on my personal channel, The Mad Italian. But be sure to check out the link in the description to head on over to the official Realm Walker channel and stay tuned for future episodes that will be uploaded over there. If you enjoy the show... Consider supporting the Patreon where we will have postmortems on each of the episodes, bloopers and outtakes, polls on the next episode, and picture shows where we will watch different movies and series together with live commentary. You can find that in the description as well. And today we're going to be starting off with the pinnacle race that's in every fantasy and even sci-fi media. We're going to be talking about the Neufia Gits that everyone hates or the loves. Pinnacle? What the hell are you talking about? It, have you have you seen any fantasy like okay, media? See, they, they little little teaser for uh, the feud for the rest of the episode chat. They are the pinnacle of pride and screwing up. I mean, everyone says, "Oh yes, the hubris of humanity," which don't get me wrong, is very true in many settings. The elves, however, just they have to do it on a higher level, and they're proud of it. Well, that's the thing; they're always the inventors of f***ing up, and then they they're just like, "How could you do this?" Because they're always like, "Well, we f***ed up, so we have to like berate everyone else on f***ing up." And uh, there's there's also no in between when it comes to elves. So that's something that I've noticed when it comes to like the research I've done with many of the elves. Uh, in my journey is that like man there's there's no in between when it comes to like how the community looks at them they either love them or hate them yeah, yeah no i mean uh, there's um i've yet to try it and i've yet to play it but i'm kind of excited for it is the greedfall that because that's one area where i have seen elves in a setting but have yet to really see what they're about what the lore is behind it from what i've seen they heavily lean into that uh in Canada, we call them First Nations people, but obviously in the United States, they're Native Americans. They kind of leave, lean into that role in Greedfall, but I'm really excited to play that and get a better opinion on it. Uh, so it's kind of like... Uh, peoples. Yeah, it's kind of kind of like... Uh, I mean, that that can be kind of in tune with how Wood Elves are, but I guess, I guess if for starters, we should start at the beginning. We should start at really like where elves originated from in like folklore and how they kind of came to be in terms of media which if we're going to go to all the way to the beginning we got to start obviously with Tolkien we got to start with what is basically what every fantasy universe kind of takes its notes of and uh Ethan you you took the plunge today you got you decided to research some uh some Tolkien elves and uh wasn't that fun so I think, first of all, well, yes, it is It is true. I did. I took a trip down into, into Middle Earth and the realms within it, and a trip through time, and I had, I had a great trip. But the problem is, I think we should need to start instead with what is an elf and what qualifies it to be one as sort of a baseline and to what, what to weigh every race against and what makes it elf-like. Yeah, so I think a main the main aspects that make an elf, especially in a lot of modern media, a lot of modern fantasies, is usually they are the eldest race. Maybe not o not always like the oldest one. There are always precursors before. Like if you know 40k, we have the Necrons, which are the most ancient race. But Eldar are you or elves or Eldar? They're usually pretty old. They're like a very eldest species. They are attuned to magic in some way. And there's always the three main flavors of elf. There's the high elves, the high and mighty pricks. Uh, there's the dark elves, who are the deranged maniacs. And then there's the wood elf hippies. He doesn't mean to offend you, uh, CJ. Uh, if you guys can see, we happen to have a, a dark elf at the table with us right now. He doesn't mean to offend you, but he is completely right. Oh, well, I don't know about that. Well, in in the realm of the age part, I absolutely agree because that's one thing that's kind of synonymous with elves is their lengthy life, uh, lifespan because you, the Dunmer, um, it's, it's pretty characteristic of them considering 200 to be old 300 to be 
you know, going on beyond that. But then if you've ever played Morrowind, there are uh, Morrowind, and then eventually in Skyrim's DLC, you actually have a uh, Telvanni mage who has lived spanning that 200 years separating the two games. So based on both magic practices and rituals, you're you're looking at a lifespan of centuries, if not millennia. There are elves I have found in my research that do clock in at the thousands of years old, and they don't seem to age, which kind of begs the, the question, like, so when, when elves are born, like, do they just reach, like, a certain age when they stop aging? Because, you know, with maturity and when I just one begs the question is, like, physically, when do they stop aging? Because it varies a lot depending on where you travel and what you uh, enjoy. And that really kind of goes into what really makes a lot of these elves, because sometimes it comes to the point where they're kind of seen as, because if I'm not mistaken, they're kind of like in between realms when it comes to uh, like the moral realm and like the immortal realm in Lord of the Rings, aren't they? Don't they have to like volunteer to go into the afterlife? Um. So they, let me let me pull it up. So they they were originally from the realm of quende after the great god who they the, yes they were the first and eldest children of the luvitar which were the fairest and earthly race of arda they called themselves in the original language they called themselves quinde or uh quenya which were uh the speakers they were the first ever race created by <clears throat> i'm gonna get this wrong uh eru iluvitar alone in the third theme of the Andulende, which was the song that created the universe. Aruelinde is what you have to assume is basically Big G God. He created everything in the first song, which would have been essentially akin to the Big Bang. So they're they're basically kind of confirming in that case that elves are the eldest species in Lord of the Rings. They are the most ancient by far. They were personally designed by Eru Linde to be almost an... Uh, it's, it's strange. It's like they're an imperfect, perfect race. They are so designed to be perfect and fair and excellent. Yet if you look at their, their histories, they, they do have a rise and a fall, but their rise is relatively brief compared to it. They do live and they do dominate, but they become so enraptured with their own superiority and their own fear that an awareness of their weaknesses that it is their own undoing and that can very much go into play with how a lot of high elves uh, are seen where a lot of high elves and this is the same thing with warhammer fantasy and even the aldari in warhammer where it's always about this rise and fall of an empire and I think it mainly comes down to them, like, elves, and especially high elves, they always have, well, not even just high elves, but, like, elves in general, there's always something that splits them apart. They're always together as these this unified faction, but then there's something that kind of happens that splits them apart, and that's what causes this, uh, this destruction and uh, kind of leads all of them to go their own ways, where we have the high elves kind of sticking with these traditions, trying to go back to their old ways, and then we have the Wood Elves becoming more attuned to nature. And then we have the Dark Elves that go down this more deprived state when, with taking in slaves and doing some things that we can't mention on YouTube. But that's also different because the Dunmer, while they do take in slaves, they're not as depraved as something like the Druki in Warhammer Fantasy. No, not nearly as close. But then there, the other thing that I found unique about the Dunmer that... I'm not as well versed as uh, on 40k lore, unfortunately. I'm getting there bit by bit, each book, each and every book I read. But uh, one thing I found unique about the Dunmer is uh, their system of worship, and they go by ancestors, not just venerating, but actually worshiping their ancestors. And that's one thing that I found kind of unique to be just for them, as opposed to the uh, high elves and elders um, in the Elder Scrolls series which uh worship um Ariel, which is the main their main deity which was that uh, funnily enough actually uh that they, they see as a common ancestor really mm -hmm. and and would you say because obviously in morrowinds every every elder scrolls game it's always going to a different uh like a different city and it's always like the 
the most populated race that's in that city is going to be the one that's on the cover art. That's the one that's uh, always shown. And so Morrowind is the home, the home city or the homeland uh, continent of the Dunmer. Yeah, the original one. Yeah, the um, kind of it's a place that uh, they pretty much took over from the dwarves. The whole battle of the Red, uh, Red Mountain basically established that 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 was theirs after that and. Um, just as you were saying uh, in the beginning about the elves screwing everything up, it's basically pretty much the, I think it was the Chimer, which were the precursors to the three elven races in, well, there's more than three elven races, but that's a bigger subject on in Elder Scrolls, but that the Chimer were the, actually responsible for the disappearance of the dwarves. So it, depending on how you feel about that, it's that that's another you could say that that's another version of them massively screwing up. But, um, yes, uh, back to your question, yes. Uh, Res, Res Dane, I believe, was the original name for Morrowind, but it's called present-day Morrowind. Okay. Because I've been, I, and I've also been playing quite a bit of uh, Skyrim recently. I've been doing a fresh playthrough because, like, the Dunmer, and you meet quite a bit of Dunmer in uh, Skyrim as well, and they they are... Because they, they get a lot of prejudices in general just from the Nords and other civilians as well just because of their history. And I think a lot of that also stems from how elves in a lot of different media, we'll be talking about uh, Dragon Age as well uh, as wa uh, with uh, World of Warcraft, because a lot of it kind of stems from just how they're viewed through history. A lot of that is kind of very, uh, a lot of prejudice kind of comes from them because of their ups from the from the past 40k is no different it's always about no. yeah it's always it's always about like how they fucked up in the past and that's a big part of how Al aldari are which are one of the biggest and most important races because they were there with the beginning with the uh the war in heaven which is the, the bigger the whole other thing we will not be getting into most likely today yeah exactly but we can also talk about how the aldari because there's not too many s depictions of space elves but, like, the Eldari are definitely the most pinnacle ones when it comes to space elves. And they, they very much have that aspect of having this empire built up and having a drastic fall. And we do get the three flavors of elves in 40k as well. With We have the Eldari, the uh, craft worlds, which are... Um, which are the High Elves, basically. We have the Drukhari, which are the Dark Elves. And even though we don't have them as actual playable models, we do have the Exodites, who are essentially uh, Wood Elves, because they're riding dinosaurs and doing all this crazy shit. And yeah, yeah GW will not give us any fucking models, will they? Hope. I yearn one day. Hey, they did do the new Phoenix Lord update, and the Phoenix Lord update they did recently was very cool. And... Seraphon are a pretty popular model range in uh, Age of Sigmar and Fantasy. I, I think Exodite could be like just a cool, like slightly smaller range. I think it could work like like the Gene Steeler Cult, but let's not get too distracted. I do want to um, remind everyone that when we're discussing this, we're going to try to avoid talk when we're discussing an overall race like this. We're not going to be discussing individual characters that much unless they are so integrally important to the lore mm -hmm. we are only going to be discussing their overall history aspects and what universes we think do them best we are not going to be discussing individuals because it's just that's a whole other episode in and of itself so when we do an episode on dwarves same thing humans most likely and that's so, also unless we're like mentioning them passively and they're they're, they're just going to be like a like a glancing kind of like mention here and there Correct. Like obviously, we can't we can't really mention the the Druki in fantasy without mentioning uh, what's his name Malakith. Yeah. Yeah. Like I I don't even have you know what's crazy in my notes right here I don't I do not have Galadriel. Oh, from from Lord really? of the Rings. Galadriel in the overall lore of the elves and what's important she is only around and actually prevalent and important in like late into the second and third age. Mm. She has very little to do with the first first and second considering she was born after the moon was created yeah a little uh spoiler elves were created before the sun and the moon and they lived under the stars well that yeah. king that, <laughs> that, that kind of uh, sorry jake uh, that kind of translates a little bit over to the dunmer as well because one thing uh, if you've played morrowind is a reference to uh 
uh, what is it that you're referred to as Nerevar? Was it Sun and Stars? There's a, there's a lot of references with Azura and Suns and Stars as well. So that's another thing that translates over not only from Lord of the Rings but also into Elder Scrolls. And well, we we mentioned before about how it's always about. Um, we have a lot of these different types of elves that are trying to reinstate their order. Like the high elves are kind of going back to their ways. And, and uh, we kind of have that with the Thalmor in Elder Scrolls, especially in Skyrim, which uh, me passing a Thalmor patrol, eh, I'm not really I'm not really in for a fight. All of a sudden they make a racist remark to me. I turn around and quick save with malicious intent. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, oh, I just wanted to correct myself. It was Nerevar, um, Moon and Star, not Sun and Star. Moon and Star, that's what it was. Oh, okay. You will not get actually in chat. You probably will. You probably still I will, probably but will. that'll that'll <laughs> help out. People if if people don't wait until that uh that remark. But uh the thing about the Thalmor, and this might just be my basic understanding because I've haven't played Ob Oblivion in a while and I need to do another attempt at more ones. But the Thalmor, they seem like it's, it's kind of a little bit more of a darker kind of twist on how a, a lot of elves try to reinstate their their power. Where it's like, no, we, we ran this world and we're taking it back. Elf supremacy for for life. And me, as as someone who usually plays as a Nord, I'm like, nah. Screw that! You guys are I, 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 I listen. I'm usually I'm usually pro imperial, but even then, I gotta I kind of agree with uh with Ulfric Stormcloak, where that the the Thalmor lady in that one meeting should wait the fuck outside. <laughs> well, that's so one thing is that uh, that's kind of unfortunate is that there's actually some reference in uh, some of the journals you find in Skyrim when you go and rescue that prisoner uh, from the Thalmor embassy. Is that there's references to Ulfric possibly being a Thalmor, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A uh, Thalmor puppet? A Thalmor. There's a word I'm looking for. I can't think of it. But basically, a plant. That's what mm. it's. Double plant agent? The Thalmor. Well, it's, yeah, double agent. It's less. Is, is, he a, um, is he really a double agent or is he mainly just kind of being a pawn? for the war because that's really the main that's really the main issue with the war is that the Thalmor want the war to keep going on. And they I need a uh, pawn, pawn that went rogue. Yeah, well, because that's the thing is that they need it, it. There needs to be a victor in the war to really stop the Thalmor. I don't think it really matters who winning. Like as long as someone wins, I think the, the they can be, defeat the Thalmor. Right? Obviously, I think the Imperial, but that's a whole other topic. But that also kind of goes in line with how a lot of elves are, especially with their fey nature as well. Is that elves are tricky sons of bitches in almost every media they're always like they're, they always have like a bunch of new tricks they always are trying to trick people and in, like falling into traps and uh they're always one step ahead that's especially true with a lot of different types of uh elves especially warhammer like warhammer elves are like that both fantasy and 40k uh even berserk elves are kind of like that as well we'll be talking about puck we gotta talk about puck i love puck shame what happened to him but um, Lord of the Rings elves are kind of like that as well, uh, with kind of conniving. Well, they're not let me not conniving, but more of like, you you they're never showing their true hand when they're talking to you. That that is sometimes the case. It depends which elf you're talking to, um, and definitely also depends which age you're talking about. If it's in like the first or second age when the elves were at their peak, oh no, they'll show their true hand, and when I'll get into it later, um. Yeah, the, despite taking horrendous casualties in a few wars down the line, they still did dog walk all of Middle Earth. Mm. There is a reason the dwarves absolutely despise them. <laughs> and um, do you want me to get started? Or do you want to keep talking overview? Uh, let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and get started with some uh, some some lore on Lord of the Rings elves. It sounds like you're ready. Yes, I am. I have two pages of notes. I have taken over a very reasonable time and not right before recording i'm a responsible student okay i feel like that silence is directed towards me oh no it's just me me no it's just me in general i, I who 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 studies a week before a test nah fam if you study right before it'll be fresh and then you forget it on the first and then you look at yeah question number one and you're like F exactly so <clears throat> As I said earlier, they were created by the the big G god himself, Eru. Eru Iluthvatar. Iluthander, forgetting the pronunciations. 
Elf is fuck. If we screw up the pronunciation, I am very sorry to all the elf fans in in the chat. I, it, it's really difficult. There's a lot of L's in here. More L's than they take. Sorry, sorry, elf fans. It will happen again. It will. <laughs> so yes, the firstborn of Iluvatar. We're creating the third theme, explicitly theme, of Anulindeo. That that's woof. Okay. Woof. They were um, explicitly, they woke at the Quivenin, or the Water of Awakening as it's known, in the farthest east of Middle-earth, well before the time of the sun and the moon. The sun was not created yet, the sun wasn't real. They existed entirely under the stars that kept them, uh, that kept them alight. And eventually they were, the first elves were, this is during what was called the Long Night period. The first elves that were awoke were Emin, uh, his wife Emine, Tata, Tate, Enel, and Enele. They were the first three pairs of elves that would then travel west and eventually find more and more of their kind along with different specialities. They had, they found the wood elves, they found, they were, the original six were the first high elves, and they would keep coming along more and more and more until they totaled up to 144 elves. And they created, uh... They created poetry and music originally for Middle Earth. And eventually they content and were in near the land of Quivenin, which was where they were first created. However, the Dark Lord, the original Dark Lord, not who you think it is, Melkor, the original of the fallen small g gods, like a tier above the Vanir. But below Elithuro was before them, and he sent spies to kind of, you know, poke the elves, see, like, what their, what their deal was. Like, this was, like, the first, like, real power in Middle-earth. What are we, what are we dealing with here? And eventually, the elves caught word of this, and the... They got, they got word of it, and they got panicked. They ended up running away, and they got corrupted, and they were mutated into the very first orcs. There are no Dark Elves in Lord of the Rings. Not in the sense that you think of. Not with, like, drow or anything like that. No, no, no. They Dark Elves are orcs. What do you, what do you think? And and well, it's it's interesting you mentioned that because I actually looked up what the first depiction of dark elves came from because uh, there there are no dark elves. There, there's only really the the ones that we know in Lord of the Rings from the movies and the books. We know there are high elves, and we also know that there are wood elves. Uh, those are kind of like the two originated ones that are from Lord of the Rings. the The earliest depiction of dark elves that I could find was Drow from Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, the first edition uh, D&D actually had drow that were depicted as enemies. So that's kind of where a lot of the ideas of dark elves kind of came from, was from drow. And if you guys have played any amount of Baldur's Gate 3, you know that uh, Minthara is the pinnacle uh, drow, and you do spend quite a bit of time in the Underdark. And you do. You see a lot of not just drow culture, but also a lot of the other underdark races as well. And uh, it's not a great place. It it very <laughs> it very much does paint that kind of picture that we've come to expect with a lot of other dark elves in other media, where they are very oppressive. They run things into the ground. Everything it's it's a monarchy, and everything is uh, turning into shit. What did they mean by this? Hmm. <laughs> It's an awful monarchy. It's like, man, well, I don't know, man. But even even like Drow, they have such an interesting society because Minthara even mentions this when you talk to her, is that uh, she actually has a great zinger for Gale in this. Uh, poor Gale, you can't catch a break. Mm. Um, but he has a, she has a great zinger where she will be like, uh, in Drow culture, the third child is usually ostracized or even killed before they, uh, they, they're they even born. You have the aura of a third child among you. <laughs> Which is pretty damn cruel, considering that I am a third child as well. So, 
but besides Man. besides the point, yeah, Drow. That's kind of where a lot of the dark elf culture kind of came from. It came a lot from D and D and kind of having establishing the Forgotten Realms in this kind of uh, environment. So. And that's why I think a lot of the time dark elves are are very they are they are a very easy antagonist to make because they're definitely the most smug pricks out of all of them. Ten percent, they are absolutely like awful people, and th- a lot of the time they revel in it. Yeah, like they are they take great pride in the fact that yes, we know we're awful, and they'll either go one of two ways: they're either claim that they're doing it to survive. Or they'll just say, no, we just do it for the love of the game. Mm-hmm. And that's actually pretty pronounced with um, the Dalish and the City Elves in Dragon Age Origins, is that the, the Dalish have that smug, arrogant attitude of, well, we're upholding our, our customs, our history, our traditions, and everything, and then they thumb their noses down at that. It, like, they'll take in City Elves every now and again. There's that instance of that one boy in the Dragon Age 2 who was having those dreams and yeah, so that's a whole another other thing with call, bringing out demons with his dreams and stuff. But um, uh, the Dalish, I would say, it again, like Jake mentioned early, it heavily depends with Dragon Age games because they, they they change so much with each game and their depiction gets kind of muddled. But the smug, arrogant thing definitely it translates to almost pretty much everything. But then there's the kind kind of sort of forced humility with the city elves. Yeah, and that's something that I actually, at least with the first few games, I would I would like to say this because I, at least I came I came out with the with the Veilguard video recently. So if you guys saw that, you know my stance on Veilguard. But what something I really appreciated, at least when it came to the city elves, is that Dragon Age actually did something unique with elves. Um, the Dalish elves are very much a similar copy and paste uh, concept of wood elves. We can agree to that. They, you know, attuned to nature. They're very much... Uh, who's the bald guy in Origins? The bald elf? Zathrian? Zathrian, yeah. He's he's very much like... He's very bitter about what the humans did to him. And it's all about they trespassed in our lands, this whole thing. He very much has that wood elf kind of aura to him. But they do something unique with city elves, which is instead of making them the typical uh, high elves that are always trying to regain their power, they take it away from them. They are, like, beggars, they live in alienages, they're basically in ghettos. And it's it's very interesting to see that they're actually, the, the best jobs that they can have are serving as maids and servants to humans. So, it's something that stood out a lot more to me, um, which I think Dragon Age did a really good job with making that stand out. And it, they really did a great job at making their universe stand out, especially with Origins. And even even the Dalish had their own thing that kind of made them stand out as well, because they overall didn't really have a choice, because it was either that or just be poor in the city. Yeah, and uh, there's even a lot of instances and references that the history, the common... the Lore is the wrong word, but the history, the common culture that they have is in itself muddled like that they, they, they claim to uphold the traditional dalish values their history that goes back millennia but there's a lot of inferences and a lot of references and a lot of uh what uh i'm tired so i'm having trouble coming up with the words here it's, uh contrary a lot of con- uh contrary statements in Dragon Age that say no, a lot of what you're doing is not as old as you think and there's a lot of muddled belief that what they're practicing isn't actually what their ancestors did millennia ago. So what the Dalish are so snobby about isn't actually their most purest traditions in its most true form. And that kind of goes into another similarity that we see with a lot of elves in all these media is that emotion is the most important thing to them because a lot of the times their emotions are heightened. Their emotions are very much at play, and they are very prideful individuals. Every elf, whether they're wood, high, or dark, they are incredibly prideful. And they might not admit it, but they will always show it with their ego. And They, they won't admit it, but the results will speak for it. I haven't even gotten like that far down, and I can prove to you that elves are beyond that of prideful with what they've done 
Which in, that's why when I brought up the city elves, I say forced humility. That that is a forced humility that they have on them. Mm-hmm. Because even though they're kind of more down in the dumps in the in the city, they're still holding a lot of that mark of what they used to be and kind of what they know that the humans don't. But uh, did you have did you have anything else to share with uh, Lord of the Rings elves? I have a bunch more to share. We. So I know I said earlier that I wouldn't bring up, you know, individual characters, and Melkor himself isn't even an elf. However, I cannot talk about the history of the elves and where they ended up without talking about him. So yeah, I had to, I had to make an executive decision and bring him up. So um, as Melkor came into being and became more powerful, uh, he was... Fun facts, for those that don't know, the original commander of the Dark Lord Sauron. The really? commander of the ring was just a lieutenant to Melkor. And worked very close and was quite loyal to him. Knew better than to rebel against him. Mel Melkor was what was known as a fallen Valar, which were basically like... They're, not, they're almost like a tier above angels in a way, or... Maybe they are akin to angels. It gets kind of it gets kind of muddied with how Lord of the Rings is, but at, at both parts very biblical and very Norse, and so there's a lot of different conflicting representations and similarities. So it's a little hard to find them. But well, let's that just comes say... from um, uh, Tolkien himself, who was a devout Catholic. In addition to the fact that the earliest representation of elves come from Norse mythology. Absolutely, and he was a huge Norse mythology fan, and so it, it, is, it is very clear that these are two very differing and very potent belief systems thrown into a pot together. That's not a bad thing, it just makes it a little tricky, you know, do your traditional comparisons and analogies that I love with my teachings. And that kind of goes into a lot of the, the fey kind of inspiration that comes with a lot of these types of elves, because a lot of it comes from, you said Norse mythology, right? Correct. Yeah, so a lot of that comes from these very old stories of the land of Alfheim, where these elves were very, they were always like very tricky creatures. They were kind of seen as these uh, sometimes benevolent, but sometimes also mo malevolent. And you never know, they could be leading you to treasure or they could be leading you to your demise. And kind of going into that whole idea of tricking people and uh, kind of having fun. And that kind of goes into the idea of uh, Berserk Elves in a way as well, because Berserk also has a quite unique way, but they stay in line with that very fey kind of aspect of them, where the elves that we see in Berserk are depicted as uh, tiny little pixies. The, the, mm -hmm. most prominent, the most prominent member is Puck, who I actually believe was the inspiration for uh, Navi and the fairies in... Uh, Legend of Zelda. And also, I want to go ahead and mention right now, we're not going to be talking about Hylians. They are not elves. They just have Hylians point... Hylians are not elves. Chica, kind of. But no, they Hylians are not an elf-like. They are no. a human-like. They just... If you happen to only see um, an elf-like species as species with pointy ears, congratulations. Orcs are now an elf-like. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, we're not going to be talking about Hylians because as far as... We can all agree that they're basically just the humans of Legend of Zelda. But Absolutely. when it comes to Berserk Elves is that this kind of also goes in line with how uh, sometimes like the elves can be very attuned and they can kind of exist in between realms. Uh, so the elves, they kind of exist. Like Puck it himself kind of exists in this little in-between pocket dimension because there is this land uh, of Elfheim. And that is where they end up going in a later arc in the series. And it's, the whole idea is that all, a lot of these mystical and, like, fairy tale type of creatures do exist. But they kind of get leaked out in a pocket dimension. But eventually, it gets, uh, those dimensions get merged. And the, the, the dimension of uh, fairy tale-like creatures gets merged with the real world. There's, like, this mortal plane, and then there's this fairy tale plane. And then once it gets merged out and once these worlds get combined, it's all of a sudden all of these are existing in the same world. And uh, it's becoming a lot more common to see a lot of these uh, creatures. And that's kind of, that's an interesting thing because like Berserk kind of goes from a dark fantasy to more of a traditional fantasy. It still does keep the, 
the fantasy like the dark fantasy aspects of it and it still kind of keeps the mature tone but it kind of does slowly over time leak a lot more of the fantastical elements in there so it's a very interesting way to see it but the attitudes of elves in berserk they have a very happy-go-lucky attitude and they are generally genuinely seen as positive figures puck is a very positive guy which makes it very entertaining when he combines with guts who is just the most negative person ever He's a struggler, all right. Yeah. <laughs> He's just like me for real. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Puck is, he is a very like positive figure, even though he is kind of like going on this little more tricky kind of, uh, mood he's he's very much like he's he's playful he's he's very much just kind of having these these fun moments and it does kind of get a little unfortunate because he just kind of gets relegated to to the comic relief but they're all seen as just kind of like these goofballs in a way it's just it's the classic dissonance uh puck is an elf character from berserk what's berserk i'm not familiar with this chat kill this man yeah okay you ever you know the character guts Okay, god Chat. damn it. Okay, god damn it. Okay, so Berserk is a dark fantasy series. It came out in, it came out in the late 80s. It's a uh, manga. Um it, the main character's name Guts. Go. There you go. Yeah, okay. Fine. We're, we're moving on. That's why I don't know it. Here we go. I'm I'm sending pictures to the oh, god damn oh, it. Holy cow. Um Hang on. This is going to, Okay. Why just This is upsetting to me, man. Like you you don't know the iconic Berserker armor? Right, he doesn't play Souls games. He doesn't play good games, chat. Just, just, yeah. Holy. Okay. Oh, all right. Okay. We're not even, like, 20 minutes in, and I already need a drink. Oh, God. If I can cause you pain, I will. Ugh. Okay. Uh, you, here, let, let me get us back on track uh, off this, you know, horrible tangent. Uh, I'm going to talk more about Tolkien Elves while Jake tries not to have a heart attack. Just, just, there, just buddy? fucking keep going. Okay, bud. So... The going back into the topic of Tolkien orcs and how Melkor started making plays and wanting to corrupt and rule. The Vala Oromo, the the Vala, or which are known as the smaller aspects of the great god Eru, uh, the Vala Orome, came to them and offered guidance, granting them the name Eldar, E L D A R, which translates to Children of the Stars. And while they weren't quite combat ready yet, uh, Melkor decided, you know what, I'm just going to go fight them anyway. And Melkor clashed with the Valar near the elven home of Quivenin, which was where they, the elves were originally spawned. They, they don't know what happened. All they heard was the sound of mountains breaking and lightning striking. Yeesh. And Melkor was eventually defeated, and he served his time... For three ages, as the elves prospered and ruled over their lands. Upon serving his time, however, he was uh, set free. The Valar set him free, and he was... He slightly, very subtly, puppet-mastered the ruling families, pitting them against each other. Now, I know I said I wouldn't talk about main, like, individual characters. This is, like, one of their few exceptions. His name was Feanor, a gifted smith who crafted the Silmarils, the Silmarils, which had the light of the two world trees themselves, the original birthers of the sun and the moon, stored within them. He basically created a portable star. What's up with these fucking elves always connecting their main, their main things to trees, man? Couldn't be me. I'm going to go get an axe and cut one down. Yeah. S Sylvanas be like that. <laughs> uh, Melkor himself even pretended to say, "Yeah, I've turned over a new leaf. I I want uh -huh. to, I want to make myself better. I want to make the world better." He taught the elves the their way of craftsmanship and magic, while also telling them that the that men were going to start existing soon. He had heard from the Valar having been one himself before that men were going to start existing in middle earth which they weren't currently in right now they were in a different realm why did i not write this down i'm a failure they were in the uh the realm of amon which was 
the lands west, where we see at the end of Return of the King, that's where the elves are returning to. They are returning to their original land of Amon, and once the elves hear word that, oh, there's this new race coming out on a realm that we used to live on, they're going back on our turf, and they start getting a little bit paranoid, a little bit weird. And Feanor himself, his paranoia, his arrogance, and his pride became great and dangerous. So much so, even though he like he never trusted Melkor, not not in the slightest, but he knew he was telling the truth. And so he played perfectly into his hands by sowing unrest within the elven population to the point where Feanor himself drew his own sword on his half-brother, Fingolfin. And you basically had a small civil war. Feanor regretted it practically immediately, and the civil war was put down. He was brought to court before the Valar, where Melkor's lies and deceits were shown to them. He still, however, was banished for 12 years before being welcomed back by his uh, by the king of the Valar, Manwe. Only to have the party crashed by Melkor and the great spider Ungoliant. Not Shelob, Shelob's mother. Oof. Murdering his father Finwe and destroying the two world trees, plunging the land of Valar into darkness. But wait, there's more! He also stole Feanor's greatest prize, the Silmarils as well leaving the elves without light for another 50 years as he fled to Middle-earth, founded a new name for himself along with a new land named after such a title. He would be known as Morgoth and his realm of Mordor. What's up with all of these, these like elves that are turning into like darker figures? They always have M's in their names. Yeah. I remember only... there there's a reference to that in the uh, oh no that was R the letter R wasn't it There's a reference to that in the in that episode of the office but I was thinking of which one I was thinking he the uh, the office when Dwight was talking about that why the the word murder sounds so menacing and it's because the word uh, the letter R it, it, it sounds more menacing saying murder not muck duck probably cuz it sounds like conquer cuz it's like a gur sound little etymology lesson for everyone you get that free of charge well, you you also mention a lot of a lot of family drama is consistent with a lot of uh, elf lore as well because that actually reminds me quite a bit of a lot of the drama that went down with the night elves in World of Warcraft and just Warcraft in general is that Illidan, which I'm sure a lot of you know, you've probably even if you haven't played a uh, WoW, you've probably seen that cinematic with him. You are not prepared. Hey, I mean, hey, whoa, 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 whoa! I play Hearthstone. Okay. <laughs> Illidan is a, is actually a character in Hearthstone. You can actually uh, feel the deck. He's a a hero. Hearthstone's great. Play it. Don't play WoW. Don't play. Don't play Magic either. Jake, Jake, cut this part out. Anyway, uh, no, don't don't you dare. <laughs> uh, anyway, so a lot of yeah, a lot of family drama, and that is actually a big aspect of what Warcraft is going through, especially with the the Night Elves. Um, we'll talk. We're going to talk a little bit about the Night Elves because they done fucked up. Um. A lot of it is kind of good uh, because a lot of the drama that kind of comes with the night elves is basically just these two brothers that were fighting over a girl. And Bruh. one of them, one of them even got to a point where, so there's Malkavian who was the older brother and he was kind of like the stud guy, you know? And then there's Illidan who was like, yeah, I kind of want to do my own thing. And he tried to be—he tried to be a uh, a druid. He couldn't really do it that well, so he, instead he became a uh, semi-decent uh, spellcaster instead. And a lot of that was so they they kind of had different ideas on how to like better run their city. And Illidan, the thing about Illidan, and this kind of goes in with a couple of different types of elves as well. And uh, is is a lot of the a lot of times like elves kind of have a problem with. With getting a little too close to demons and demon like <laughs> things. So Illidan kind of had this problem where he saw that he could get power and he was like, hey, I can get power and I can better protect the like our land and our tree because they, they have like a, their own world tree as well that gets burned down not once, fucking twice. Damn. 
Um, but it will then kind of for a third. I mean, listen, man. If you if you give if you give Blizzard enough time, I'm sure they'll burn it down. Uh, I, I want to see what, who who could win in the contest, but between who hates elves more, fucking Blizzard or Bioware. Um, <laughs> but uh, Bioware is doing a pretty good job right now. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I, honestly, I think they hate elves more than the fucking player base does. But the the thi- so Illidan kind of got a little too close to this demon skull, and he ended up becoming a half demon. And uh, the girl, the girl that he was interested in, was like, "Dude, you're a fucking idiot." And uh, now that being said, he actually, he actually still did some pretty good things despite everything. Like he, he actually, uh, because there were also the blood elves. So the night elves are the wood elves of WoW, and the the blood elves, they they were just kind of like doing their own thing. So the blood elves are, they were originally the high elves. And they were kind of having their... They, they were doing their own thing. They're just kind of in their own land. And after... Uh, the Blood Elves are... Or the, uh, the the High Elves at this point. They were known as the Sindore. And... So they're doing their own thing. They have this thing called the Sunwell. And that's where they get their Ar- Arcana. Because as usual, like... Especially High Elves. They they are very much attuned to magic. And they, they use magic for pretty much everything. And then uh, this one guy, this one undead guy known as Arthas came around, and he's like, hey, oh, Lord, hey, okay. hey, that's fucking cringe. And he burned down the Sunwell, and uh, he also murdered, like, 90% of the High Elf population. Yo, base, that's my goat. So, yeah, he, he kind of, he, he, he did not fuck around when it came to murdering elves, like... Uh, CJ, do you know who that guy in Elder Scrolls lore is that is all about murdering elves? Uh, you're talking about was that e- uh, Isgrimor? Yeah, honestly, I think that he would get along with Isgrimor quite a bit because man, do they do they really like murdering elves? So, so th- the thing is that when that happened, when he destroyed the Sunwell and like on top of murdering 90% of uh, elves. The thing is, is that the, the, the elves, they were, the, the, uh, the high elves at the time, they were reliant so much on it that they didn't even realize they were addicted. They were oh. literally, it was basically like getting cut off, like a drug addict getting cut off from his supply. And they were like, I, I don't know what to do with myself. And they, like, are getting, like, different shakes. They're getting, like... They, they don't know what to do with themselves because the, the Sunwell was basically their source of arcana and they didn't know what to do. So they're like, what the fuck? I can't get magic anymore. This is awful. That Like, how am I supposed to live like this? So they the, the remaining High Elves, they kind of travel for a little bit trying to find, like, a cure to this addiction. Trying to find a way out of this. And with the combination of some demons, and then finally Illidan himself, he actually taught them that they could get the Arcana back. They could get the magic source back by absorbing from living creatures. Oh. So that that does include demons. And that was kind of the whole idea. It's like, you can use this to absorb from demons and use it from other evil beings. And... For the most part, they do do that, and that's why when you look at the Burning Crusade trailer, you actually see a blood elf taking it from from a dragon, and kind of like raising this young little drake dragon, and then it's like, oh, it's so cute, and then she takes the life essence away and uses it as magic, and it's like, oh. And that's kind of when they they start becoming blood elves, that's when they kind of have this whole idea, it's like, okay, now we can satiate our hunger for, for like magic. Now, the thing about the Night Elves and the Blood Elves is that uh, Night Elves do not like mages. And it's important to understand is that mages and druids are seen as different from each other in the Warcraft universe. Like, druid magic is seen as a more kind of pure-based type of thing. You're more attuned to nature. You're more connected to the wilderness. All that hippie shit, right? (laughs) Um, and, and the, the thing is that the Blood Elves are all about magic, and the thing about magic is that, well, magic's dangerous, and the, the thing about Night Elf culture is that being a mage is punishable by death. Oh, wow. Like, it's that, it's that frowned upon. Yeah, a major disdain for spellcasters. Fascinating. Yeah, and the, the thing about that the... That has a parallel in Dragon Age, in Dragon Age too, with just how mages are looked on with disdain to the point where they're put into a circle and it's like you're not going anywhere as outside of that unless you have a templar with you yeah and that's kind of like yeah that's what well, we can get into that when we get to the mages episode but the the thing about 
so there was a lot of there was a lot of beef between them. There was a lot of beef between Blood Elves and Night Elves because they just disagreed on a lot of their cultural differences. And there was a lot of just bigotry going on between them, and they never really saw eye to eye. So the Blood Elves ended up kind of cutting away from the Alliance and other Alliance races because of that. Um, and so they were kind of left with nowhere else to go. But there was another faction that was like, hey, we value power and we value might and we, we are all about, you know, combining our efforts to, like, survive in this world. And uh, it, was, it was the Horde. The Horde actually opened their doors to the Blood Elves and they were kind of, like, they, they were accepted into this group. And that's why, uh, personally, like, like Elves and, and WoW are probably some of my favorite types of Elves just because they, they have a lot more depth to them. And specifically Blood Elves. I think uh, Night, Night, Elves, Night Elves are a bunch of pieces of shit. But, like, I, that's why I like the, the Blood Elves, because they actually have a little bit more of, like, intrigue to them. Especially after the shit that Arthas did, man. Like, Holy smokes. But yeah, it's 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 very interesting to see that just kind of how different how different that can be, especially looking at how wood elves kind of see things. Because you know, high elves are very much the more magically attuned ones, and also just the arguments that can come in with a lot of family drama uh, within elves as well. Because that's kind of similar to how Dragon Age is as well with Solus's whole fuck up. Yeah, I mean, we we we, we remember Inquisition, remember his screw up. But then it just it doesn't go anywhere in Veil Guard, so it's like it's not even. I give, I give up. Well, I mean, we can. <laughs> I mean, listen, we can remember the good times, man. We can remember the good old days. Well, what what's this? What's the saying? Um, don't be sad because it's over. Be happy that it happened. Yeah, exactly. Smile that it happened. Yes. Smile that it exactly. happened. Thanks, Doctor Seuss. <laughs> but uh i'm gonna go back to the tolkien lore because this is actually where it actually starts to get really interesting i'll be I, I will be the first to admit that when i first like the first like page or so of notes i had as i was taking it and writing it down and having to deal with melkor and all that it was like really boring right up until um feanor pulled the sword on his brother i was entirely bored this was more dry than a diddy party before the costco run i could not care boy, is that an huh boy is that an analogy yeah no Thank kidding. You. until but the second he drew his sword like yes we have infighting we have finally these hyper powerful families actually at each other's throats and this was interesting and then it only gets better as the elves uh basically launched the war of the jewels which was far greater than the war of the ring this lasted for centuries. The War of the Ring lasted for about eight years. Of course it did. And <laughs> they, the elves launched their attack, and it was over the course of about five battles that they pushed back. I'm not going to go in-depth in on all the battles. That's just no way. I already have these documents are already way too long as is. However, what's really interesting is that when they fought and they pushed Morgoth's forces back... They conquered the land. They did not return it. Mm. So if they were human or dwarf, especially dwarves, all that land that they had conquered and taken for the elves. That's why the dwarves are so bitter against them. They were playing Civ. Yes. <laughs> they I said, like oh yeah, you're under new management now. They pulled a Titan from Mega Man. Mega Mind. And it was just... They, and that's why they're so bitter is because all those mountains and all those homes that they had cherished for so long and worked hard to defend against Morgoth. And then here come these slender pointy eared freaks from nowhere. And they, while taking heavy casualties, do push Morgoth's forces back. The dwarves and the humans at the time, they, they didn't have the forces to stand up against them. Hmm. No way. And the so they just... Silmarillion? Uh, Silmarillion, yes. Okay. Sorry, and, go ahead. Um, yeah, the War of the Jewels. And they, however, due to the elves, just, you know, typically this is another aspect that's pretty common with most fantasy things. In terms of population count, elves are typically on the lower end. Yeah. They are not by any means a horde faction. They are typically pretty low in number. They... But they are all individually very skilled. And 
eventually by the time of the war of the jewels was ended and Morgoth was defeated, the elves were just too spent to really hold the territory they had. And they was basically just fell back to the dwarves and the humans, the humans were grateful and the dwarves were bitter and I wouldn't have it any other way. And yeah, you, uh, I mean, the fact that they are such a low, a lower species, like a lower population species, it, it kind of, that, that's something you see that very often because, you know, but except I would say like, how, how common would you say they are in Elder Scrolls? In regards to uh, how often you see them? Yeah. Cause I mean, they have main cities. You go to Morrowind, you're going to see a lot of Dunmer. You go, what's, what's like the, uh, what's like the main city in, in Elder Scrolls where the Altmer are from? Um, well, they're from the Somerset Isles. Um, as to what, like that, like the, uh, you're talking about the capital, capital city? Yeah, well, I'm just saying in terms of like, they're, they're not like an endangered species in, in Elder Scrolls, would you say, right? Well, the, um, the, uh, well, it also depends on what game you're talking about, because in Morrowind, obviously, the Dunmer are flourishing, they're doing great, but then by the time Skyrim happens, well, the Red Mountain has just exploded, making almost all of them, pretty much all of Morrowind uninhabitable. Oof. Solstheim is one of the only inhabited places that the uh, that the elves can go, which the Nords still have a tiny tenuous grasp on, but that's like a small Nordic tribe. Anyways, the, the de uh, Dunmer had pretty much been decimated be uh, because of that, so when you see the Dunmer in Skyrim, you do see quite a few of them, but a lot of them are situated in um, Windhelm. Mm-hmm. So, so even I then, guess. even then, like they're still kind of having trouble in uh, even in Elder Scrolls as well. Even though that kind of ha they have like a lot of main cities. Uh, oh yeah, oh yeah. I got, well, then the uh, the freaking yeah, someone's gonna get a giggle out of this. But yeah, no, the Argonians then invade Morrowind as well. <laughs> oh boy, the smallest Argonian W. <laughs> Let's go. I, I I saw I saw a comment that was on like the Thalmor all the Thalmor insults uh, depending on the race where it's like uh, crawl back to your swamp little Argonian and and someone replied with the swamp that you didn't conquer. Let's yeah. go. <laughs> exactly. Black marshes. I uh, love dunking on elves. I love it. Got a shout out my lizard boys. Let's go. Yeah, you'll you'll very quickly learn that uh, Ethan is the shut it shut shut shut. I just think lizards and dinosaurs are cool. Ethan's a scaly. Shut. <laughs> I'm not. They're they're not a fit. Hang, hang hold on. I, I, I yeah, you I, you play like listen. I'm just saying you have made two fucking Dragonborn characters in Baldur's Gate. All right. A meme and it's funny. And you have only made a fucking Argonian in Skyrim. All right. Because it at this point I'm so committed to the bit it's funny. Hang on, we're, we're, and, hang and on. you also you this you, is how I feel. You this also I said feel every damn day. you also said if you were to get into AOS you would play as the fucking lizard men. Well, yeah. Have you seen Croak? He does look cool. There, I just sent it to the Realm Walkers Instagram chat. Everyone, look at that. I have this shit saved for whenever y'all call me a scaly. This is how I feel. All right. Well, anyway, back to fucking knife ears. Um, but anyway, um, we we're talking. What we we're talking about? We we're talking about Elder Scrolls. So yeah. So e e so even in Elder Scrolls, like elves are still on the. Is that so? Is that why the Thalmor are so like extreme with how much they want to take back control? Well, the other thing too about the Thalmor is that they're part. They're pretty power crazed after defeating the Empire. That's what the whole White Gold Concordat was about. Like the Empire is pretty much what the Empire in Oblivion is just decimated compared to the Empire. But so you you even look at the uh, the armor. The one thing I think Oblivion did better was obviously because of the setting. Oblivion is in Cyrodiil, so obviously the heart of the Empire. You get a better look at what the Empire is like. But the oh, they did such a better job with the armor in Oblivion as opposed to Skyrim because the Skyrim's. The regular Legion armor just looks stupid, but that's besides the point. The uh, Thalmor are pretty much high as a kite on on power at this point because they've defeated the Empire. So that this is where, again, where the pride of the Elves comes out. That they're top of the class right now. We'll have to see what happens in Elder, 
Elder Scrolls 6, 85 years when it comes out from now. <laughs> yeah, so I was about to say. Five years, dog. Elder Scrolls 6 for the PlayStation 6, maybe. PlayStation 7. Ugh. Exactly. I hate it, man. I feel bad for y'all Elder Scrolls fans. Uh, well, we have... It's a nice thing about being an Elder Scrolls fan is that you have uh, you have the older games to go back to. And I'll tell yeah, you yeah, you have you have you have Skyrim, Skyrim OG, Skyrim Anniversary, Skyrim Special Edition, Skyrim on the phone, Skyrim Elder Scrolls Six, Skyrim Two, Skyrim Two. <laughs> <laughs> You're going back to Skyrim. You're back in the building. We're be hold hold on. Thank you. You're welcome, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Me and the boys walking up into the College of Winterhold again. <laughs> again. God damn it. <laughs> oh, and the best ending would be if the Imperials uh, took it all over. Right, right, CJ? What do you mean? The Empire is lost. Nah, they won. Well, it also, that that's kind of an interesting thing to look at because it really does show that the the elves, they kind of like bided their time a little bit. And they were like, oh, hey, look, uh, all these like Daedra and fucking demons and this leak from Oblivion was just fucking up the, the Empire. Hey, they're weakened. Let's go fuck it up and take it over. Yeah. Yeah. Got, smart play. <clears throat> now, mean, did the elves have a hand in sending those demons after them? Probably. Well, the no, other no. thing about the uh, the uh, about that was the Mythic Dawn. The Mythic Dawn was a multiracial thing. Like, there's a bunch of different races in the Mythic Dawn for going from both human and elf. What like what do you mean? Can you give me a bit more of an example? Like it? Okay. Have you? No, you haven't played Oblivion, Frick, have you? No, I have not. I don't play bad games. Oh, you don't know anything. Um, basically, when you go into the cave, there's this part of the main quest in Oblivion. Where you go into the cave to infiltrate the Mythic Dawn, who are trying to bring back, um, what's his nuts? Uh, da Dagon. Mayrun's Dagon. They're trying to bring him back into Oblivion, bringing him out from his, uh, bring him out from Oblivion, rather, into the, into Nern, into, into, uh, reality here. And the priests and the, all the Mythic Dawn cult members who are doing this are from a bunch of different races. Like, you have Bretons, you have Dunmer, you have Altmer, you have Imperials. You ha and I think there was even a couple Khajiit in there. So, the ones who are trying to bring back this Daedric God were a bunch of... Uh, weren't just one specific race of people or elves in this, uh, in this um, circumstance. Okay, so it's it, it is like a a culmination of races and people that are trying to bring these things back. So it wasn't really like a singular group that was responsible for it. It was way more of just these kind of crazed uh, cult members that are that are doing it. I would be open to correction, but I don't think there's any connection between the Thalmor and the Oblivion Crisis. Yeah, it, it, none that I've seen. It sounds to me that they were they, they're they're more opportunists, and they just kind of saw their moment, and they're like, "All right, it's time to go take it over." Strategically thinking, it would be the best thing to do. You see, I mean, what was it Napoleon that said? Whenever your enemy's making a mistake, don't interrupt him. Well. I've, if your if your enemy is getting the crap kicked out of him, it's like why step in, why step in when you can just watch it happen, then step in when everything's over and done with. Yeah, which is which is an interesting yeah an interesting way to to see it. But um, I think we can something that we can uh, segue over to is whether whether or not elves are always seen as either antagonist or if they're seen because in most cases they're not. I think a lot of people because something that elves always are able to kind of be smart about in the end, and this goes for almost any fantasy setting, is that they always realize we have to work together. Reluctantly, at this at some point, they always come together with the humans and the dwarves, or whoever it is they have to work together with, and they realize we have to reluctantly work together, if not temporarily. Even in 40k, where everyone hates everybody, the Aldari are, are willing to work with the Imper uh, Imperium. Semi-frequently. Which they, is they will still happily kill each other at a moment's notice. I do not care who gets resurrected by an elf witch. Uh, they would still happily put a gun to each other's head. 
A exactly. But even then, some of the some of the most famous moments in 40k have been uh team ups with the Aldari. Like the big like one that we can easily mention is the resurrection of Gilliman in in 40k, where that was very heavily influenced by uh Yvrain and the Yanari. But even even in the Horus Heresy, like uh Eldrax? What Eldrad. Was? Yes. Eldrad, yeah. Like Eldrad even warned, like he did this was kinda like the El the Elvish knowledge that was he was trying to pass down to a certain soon to be snake boy. Um, he was like, hey, uh, don't touch that sword. And then Fulgrim was like, nah. Nah, I'd win. He, he, did, not, <laughs> he did not win. No, no, he did not. And, and that kind of goes... Did the opposite of win. Yeah, he, he, he kind of <laughs> lost. He lost pretty hard. <laughs> he lost real hard. But, but that kind of goes into favor, like, even though... Because I feel like... Despite a lot of the shit that a lot of uh, Eldar and Elves kind of do, even though they might be pricks, they they don't. And they deserve, and they deserve, yeah. But they do, they do want what's best for the rest of the world and other species because I think they according will. According to them, according, yeah, for their for their benefit, obviously. But yes. it, in a way, they do want what's best for the world in in a sense because i feel like they even kind of have a little bit of that wisdom it's just like when you think of of like a lot of wisdom from other older races you think of something like you know master ugwe or some kind of like uh older older kind of person who is like i'm gonna help you on your way on your journey and elves are like don't do that it fucks up it's it's more of like a tough love kind of thing where it's like i've seen this before you're and and we can even talk about I can't believe I forgot his name. Who's the main, like, older elf that was, like, casted into the fire? Forgot about fucking Elrond? Uh, yeah, well, you know. I haven't... Wow, well, okay. This is... Okay. I still haven't even fucking finished my... I gotta talk about Killer Brimbor. Oh, god damn it. All right, keep going. <laughs> yeah. We've all played... So, if to, uh, the chatters who have played the Shadow of Mordor and War games... Great games. Love them to death. I have like 500 hours in Shadow of War. Great game. Not canon. However, Celebrimbor very much is. Um, he is a very much a canon character. And once, you know, Morgoth was defeated, uh, a thousand years go by and they establish their own kingdoms. Uh, Celebrimbor finds the... He was actually the last of the bloodline of uh, Feanor. And... Sauron, under the disguise of seeming like just, you know, a, a wise elf and a... Well, let me see if I can find it. Blah, blah, blah. Right, they founded the the Sylvan Elves, founded the areas of Lothlorien and Greenwood the Great. And Sauron approached Celebrimbor. Much amidst uh, Celebrimbor's friend's advice, uh, he welcomed him in. And when he heard the promises of knowledge and power and from the way olden times and Sauron taught Celebrimbor how to forge the rings. He forged all of the rings, the rings for dwarves and the rings for men, and they were all given out as gifts. And he forged them under the eyes of Sauron. And now what people don't realize is that those rings were all just basically antennas that would feed into the one ring. That's why those nine kings of men fell so quickly is because they had a direct link to Sauron's corruption. Sauron's corruption would just easily just gnaw away at them. And... The reason why the elves didn't fall is not because they were perfect, but because Celebrimbor forged them while not near Sauron. He forged them almost perfectly. They were not touched by Sauron's power. They And then he was given it to them, so they were basically just their own entities. Mm. And they and it leads on. Celebrimbor leads a revolt against him. He is slain. Rest in peace to the goat. And it leads to the War of the Rings, where the elves spend the last bit of their remaining strength to fight off Sauron's forces in the opening of Fellowship. And they limped on ever since. And most of the 
species returning to their original realm of Amon. There you have it. God damn, way, way to fuck it up. Yep. Kelly Brimbor thought he knew better than the Dark Lord, and he ended up paying for it. And yeah, so we haven't we haven't really talked that much about uh, Warhammer Fantasy Elves as well, because when it comes to when it comes to the, the, both the Warhammers in general, both 40k and Fantasy, it's actually kind of interesting because uh, we we haven't really we can start with 40k. So 40k very much like the Elves. The for those of you who are familiar with the the Birds of Slanesh and the Fall of the Eldar, there we need to like. Hold on, we need to like dial that back and explain that. Yeah, yeah, we will. So basically, the elves had the empire, and they basically had a lot. They were the ones after their victory because they basically won the war in heaven. They, they won the war in heaven. I know, Jake, the Necron fan. No, no, I I, I can admit this. All right, um, they won the war in heaven. It, it was it was over. The orcs were doing their own thing. They weren't being a problem, and they're like, all right, let's expand and let's thrive. So they thrived and. Everything that they need to do from from getting food, from expanding, from conquering, it was all done. How long did they rule the galaxy for? I, remember? Probably like a few centuries. Hang on, one moment. Let me let me check. Yeah, you want to look that up? Two minutes, please. Uh, remembering. <clears throat> oh no, they um, I, I have the War in Heaven pulled up as well. Uh, they ruled for uh, sixty million years. Yeah, so they ruled for a pretty long time. And yes. in that rule, they basically decide to themselves, well, what do we do after we're done with everything? Well, at first, you take a little bit of an interest in your culture, and you kind of start to get more enlightened by your arts. Your what's, what's the line? There is no reward for perfection, only an end to pursuit? Well, there's also another, another line where idle hands are the devil's playthings. So... They, Ain't that they start innocently enough. They just kind of make a lot of paintings, make a lot of plays. But then they're like, the thing is, is that elves, their emotions are heightened. So they kind of need to dial it up even more. So a lot of their entertainment becomes more deranged and more bizarre. And th that's where we get the divide between the different Eldar species that we mentioned mentioned before where the craft world saw everything that was happening and they were like yeah this isn't this isn't for us this isn't what we used to be we we need to go and they were like and and the thing about it is that it wasn't really a lot of at least compared to a lot of other uh like there obviously still is some drama within elf culture when it comes to the Eldari, but a lot less. It was way more of just these disagreements and people going their own ways. The Eldari and the Craftworld Eldar, they just kind of like left on their own shuttles far away from this culture. While the Drukari and all the elves that were still doing these things, and especially in a planet called Kamara, they were kind of doing the worst of it. And to those who have... Um you know, seen the boys or, you know, like you've read about what happened on the, the Epstein Island or at the Diddy parties or just how awful it was. It was, it was debauchery like that dialed up to 11. We, we took a little trip into the grim dark universe right before that birth of Slanesh. And I, Ooh, Oh, I needed to see God. Yeah. I got, I got out as soon as I could after that one. So, but and that's kind of the, the interesting thing where they're doing the worst of it and they kept on going. And when the Birds of Slanesh happened, much like what Arthas did uh, with bringing down the Sunwell, that, that was basically just a humongous population of percentage of the population of all elves were just completely swallowed up. Uh, was what, like 95 percent yeah and but that's also where we get to a lot of differences as well because obviously this is kind of similar to the whole thing with illidan where he gets a little too close to these like bad demon is de like demons and kind of like bad things that summon demons but the thing is is that illidan kind of had that issue of getting too close to demons whereas even though this has happened and even though Solnesh has kind of become this uh like an in a sense, an Eldar goddess. God? Slanesh, for those that don't know, is one of the four, the youngest of the four chaos gods. The, the Eldar had a very debaucherous upbringing, and they're all very talented mages. So whenever one dies, it impacts their immaterium very much more impactfully than 
a non-mage. I'm using very simple terms. Do not actually mean in the comments. I know what a psyker is. I have Grey Knights in front of me. Okay? Thank you. Yeah, and, and then... And then, like, uh, but, but the thing is, is that after all of this has happened, all elves from Craftworld to Drukhari to Harley Quinns, they hate Slanesh. They are completely, like, they hate them beyond belief because even after bringing them to life, they are still being consumed by them. And they see it, they see them as kind of like an ungrateful child, basically. <laughs> so. And I'm laughing because you're right. Yeah. Oh, sorry, correct me if I'm wrong about the lore, but don't the um now and with Slanesh in the picture, don't the Eldar go out of their way? Because I'm I'm still a newbie at 40k lore, but I I'm doing a little bit better more and more. That when they die, they go to Slanesh unless their souls go to a stone of some kind. That is correct. So the, it's different for each Eldar race. So the craft world, they have these things called soul stones. So if they are to fall in battle, they the, the soul stone is basically like a failsafe where instead of their soul going into the warp to be taken by Slanesh, it would instead go into the soul stone and then someone else can reclaim it and they can revive them. In terms of the Drukhari... Uh, because Drakari, Drakari souls oh. are a little bit different. So what they they have these things called homunculi. homunculi. Oh, we're going. Oh, we're going to homunculi. Oh, this is not better. Yeah. Well, you know. So basically, th there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, dark and deranged shit that happens with uh, Drakari stuff. But basically, you would make a deal. It's all about making deals. It's a pirate haven. So you give top coin to people, and it's all about. It's all about basically making deals with people that will more than likely stab you in the back, but you at least have a long enough agreement so that they will help you out in the end. So you give, you basically, get, you, you mutilate yourself in some way. You chop up a finger, like a, a thumb, something like that. You give it to a homunculi. Uh, because the thing about, the thing about Dr Drukhari is that, you know, with magic and with a lot of, well, I guess Drukhari don't really have psychers because they... Drukhari, um... That's another fun fact for Dark Elves in 40k, Drukhari. Um, magic is entirely illegal. As they do not have a soul stone and they exist in what's basically a pocket dimension called the Webway in the realm of Kamarog, magic is entirely illegal because it can, if an L, using magic in 40k is already dangerous enough. Personally, do not recommend it. Mm -hmm. But if you're an elf using magic and if you are not extremely skilled, Slanesh will basically see you pulling from the Immaterium to use as basically a spell and will just pluck you. Mm -hmm. And by plucking you, they'll either pluck your soul or worse, uh, open a portal and hello, demons are blowing through the wall. And so they don't do it at all in Kamarog. It Kamarog is only so great because it's so secure. Yeah, and it's kind of it, this kind of reminds me like now that I speak it now it's very similar to how like the differences between the blood elves and the uh, the night elves because the night elves you know they don't like magic the blood elves are all about magic kind of and in a similar way like obviously Aldari know what they're doing when it comes to psychic shit but they are um, some of the strongest psychers both on the tabletop as well as in the lore next to Thousand Suns um in lore actually no um craft world Eldar are actually stronger oh are they really. Even with Slanesh basically, you know, t holding one arm behind their back. Um, like, sure, like, maybe someone like Aramin, but, like, Eldred did throw Magnus around. Okay. So, yeah. Um, eat shit, Magnus. Woo! <laughs> Magnus can't stop taking L's. But anyway, but the thing, so, to revive yourself as, to, like, keep yourself away from uh, going to Slanesh as a Drukhari, you would mutilate yourself, give it to a homunculi, and uh, if you if you were to fall in battle, well, your soul would still go to a body part that the homunculi is keeping, and he would grow you back. He would basically, like, build you back using body parts, or he would grow you back using vats. It is a horrifying taste. In a, it's, it's really ironic that in the world of 40k, everyone's evil. That's the charm of it. That's what we love about it. The Dark Eldar are the most evil. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Hands down. And they're, they're, they're a fascinating culture. They are. If you can get past and acknowledge that, yeah, I'm playing the villain. And you're not like, you know, 
those imperial players who think that they're actually fighting the good fight you're not um insert just... gen, insert jinro uh misinterpretation meme here <laughs> but just yeah no they they have a fascinating way of culture it is a mixture of pirates and the mafia and and that's what kind of makes them so terrifying too yes the the I, i'm reading the lilith book um right now and it's very interesting to look into um how the dark eldar function because they deliberately do not um go go to war not in the traditional sense they they do not go to war they do not try to conquer that is very key they've explicitly said that we don't want to conquer we already have the best territory in Kamarog. they just want to take mm -hmm. they just want to take livestock and people um here here's um and this and lilith's boss as Bale vect is the supreme overlord of the dark eldar with one of my uh favorite quotes being um where is it give me one moment give me a moment. you guys keep talking and and th there's a there's a very big difference when it comes to how the different fact like the different types of elves kind of see each other a lot differently in uh fantasy because there isn't really that much open hostility with uh, with like craft world and Drukari, and very commonly the the Harleyquins, which is a whole other thing. Uh, they will often kind of they will often have plays. They'll have like these little meetings between the three groups, and they'll have plays to kind of show like, hey, even though we've gone in different directions, we are still connected as a species. And it's very different in fantasy because. High elves and dark elves in fantasy have open hostility with each other. They do not like each other at all. Uh, yeah, and like I said, you go back to Dragon Age. There's that open hostility between the uh, between the Dalish and the city elves because, like I said, yeah, if if you're willing to embrace the Dalish ways, you're willing to go back to tradition. Yeah, they might take you, but there's still some hostility between. No, you decided to go live with humans. We don't want you here. Yeah, well, it's also the fact of, like, you abandoned me in the fucking city to, to, to like, yeah. stay with these humans. Like, what the hell was I supposed to do? That type of thing. So um, here's, here's the quote from uh, Mr. Vex. <clears throat> one of my favorite 40K quotes. It's not a very long one. It's short and sweet. To them, they see torture as an art form. But here's, here's the quote. We are the lords of despair, masters of terror. Dread and agony are our meat and wine, and they are plentiful indeed. Are we the baddies? Yeah, they're definitely the baddies. See, see the thing, the different, the difference is that the Imperial fanboy will try to justify justify how they're the good guys. The Drukari fan will be, just say yes. <laughs> <laughs> the indomitable human spirit. Uh huh. All right, that's nice. Get in the meat grinder. Yeah. <laughs> Get, get get in the scrot the scrot lamp. <laughs> that, that, that's that, that's nice. Let me turn you into a chair. Yep. But uh, going into fantasy, like how fantasy elves see each other, the so you you have the typical flavors of elf with fantasy as well. You got your high elves, your wood elves, and then your dark elves. Uh, when it comes to what I was researching, when it came to uh, how they all see each other, basically the. The, the 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 high elves and the dark elves they're the twin siblings that are constantly competing with each other and the wood elves are the ones that say fuck you guys i'm doing weirdo shit <laughs> Be <laughs> You're good for them so and that's really kind of it is that they they are exactly what you expect like the the wood elves are very much the fey type of creatures but they basically saw all the shit that was going down and they're like nah fuck that we're going to go we're going to live in the woods we're going to go hang out with ents I, I kind of respect that. Like, you just... You don't want any part of that nonsense. And you're like, I, I don't want to be part of that drama. Sounds awful. But but not only that, the, the Wood Elves actually do another thing. So, there's a faction called Bretonia. And uh, <laughs> they're the French. 
And the thing is, is that they're playing them. They're like playing this this kingdom of uh, French people into thinking that uh, they they get healing from this this person called the Lady of the Lake. But it's really just a, a wood elf that's like a goddess wood elf that is uh, fucking with them because <laughs> she thinks really? it's really because she thinks it's funny. Go off, Queen. That's awesome. So yeah, that, that's great. <laughs> now, now the dark elves. We have some name characters. We have Malekith, who a lot of people have uh, mentioned that he is the uh, the Darth Vader of fantasy. You want to tell CJ that one joke about Vader and him? So Malekith, much like Anakin, he had issues with his master, his lover, and his uh, and his mother. Unfortunately for Malekith, they were all the same person. Ew. <laughs> okay, so I think this got retconned, and any fans... Here's my hot take. Okay, you ready? That should not have been retconned. It, it, it is one of those, like, weird things that's like, you know what, you can kind of see it. weird. I want them to be like, this is extremely uncomfortable, and you dial it back on the Dark Elves of all people? Hell no. Yeah, so, l listen, I know, I don't know if it's 100% retcon, but any, any like, Warhammer Fantasy fans in the chat, let me know if it is or not, because I want to know. I, I honestly want to know if that's still canon. But this is just, oh, this, that's, that's good world building, and I'm sorry, that is, that shit needs to stay. Oof. But the the thing about Dark Elves is that they honestly don't care for luxury. Like, the High Elves, they kind of want the whole thing. It's like, hey, we're magic. We're the magical race, and we're very attuned magical to girls. it. Yeah, we're magic girls. So let's, we might as well just, like, kind of in, invest in, like, the infrastructure and all this other stuff. And the Dark Elves are like, what the fuck do we care about that shit? You know, we're already the best. Let's just, let's, we don't have to live in luxury. We just, we just want to get as many slaves as possible to, uh, to like satisfy our needs. But the thing is uh, that makes them different from the Jukari in 40k is that there are a few, there's a few dark elves that actually embrace Slanesh. They kind of see chaos as a little bit more of like this enlightened view of like, it has opened our eyes to our full potential, that type of thing. Um, because 40k is very restrictive when it comes to the powers of chaos. It very much is heavily uh, dominated by humans, which mm -hmm. is a, a fair enough because you know the the elves the elves are a dying race. Orcs have no souls. Uh, orcs are a like a collective mushroom brain. Uh, Tyranids are a hive mind. The Tau are Ooh. tiny, um, and like the the Necrons have no souls. Right. So it makes sense in that regard, but. Fantasy is a lot more open to other races actually getting affected by chaos, in a way. For those who don't know, uh, fantasy is a separate universe from 40k. Um, and it is not the same timeline, they just use the same deities. I, I like to think of it as, basically, imagine a sandwich. The top bread is, let's say, 40k. The meat and contents in the middle is the warp where all the chaos gods and all that good stuff resides. And then the other piece of bread is your fantasy or your AOS. That's actually like a surprisingly good way to describe it. Yes. Because uh, once in a very rare blue moon, there will be very tiny crossovers, um, like Bellacor, for instance, who has been to both. Um, Kaldor Drago also popped up in fantasy, don't ask. Or was it Age of Sigmar? I think it was Sigmar. I mean, that, that's kind of just a cameo, mainly, so... Yeah. But... Yes, they are they are separate. It's not a timeline thing. They're just different universes. But uh, do you guys have anything else to add uh, before we start wrapping up? Because I got one more thing I want to mention, but if you guys have anything else for your respective... Um, the, do you want to talk about the Quins? Uh, we can talk briefly about them. Like, the, the Harley Quins, they are... It, it, like yeah, so the Harley Quinns are their own thing. So the El the Eldar do still have their own gods as well, on top of like chaos gods existing. There are other smaller entities. But Most of them got nominated by Slanesh. Except for Kekarak, who is the, known as the laughing god for the Eldar. And basically, there was a, enough belief in this god, and he was kind of powerful enough where he was able to save all of the Harley Quinns that believed in him. And uh, whenever whenever a Harley Quinn uh, falls in battle, as opposed to having a soul stone or as opposed to uh, needing a homunculi, uh, the the uh, Kegarak will will hold hold the soul in his hand, go up to Slanesh and be like, "Hey, 
Thumb War. <laughs> or, you know, it, he has been known to break into Slanesh's realm and pluck souls like a kid plucks cookies from a cookie jar. And he thinks it's hilarious. It is funny. It is very funny. And then... <laughs> most importantly, uh, the Quins also guard the greatest repository of knowledge in the galaxy, known as the Black Library. Yes, that is not just a marketing stunt by Games Workshop, if you know anything about their books. They... That is an actual place they also they also have they're they're the ones that are actually searching for a way to uh trick Slanesh into uh saving them and that's why they are the best eldar species in 40k because instead of going on these ships and crying about how better they were or constantly torturing uh people and and, and complaining about how Slanesh ruined every, anything the the harley quints are like nah we're gonna find a fucking solution to this shit we're gonna do something about it yeah so that's why we have the most based Harley Quinns, and it just sucks that they're they're so difficult to paint. And that uh, you know the rules that keep getting shafted. I think they're gonna have. I think I heard rumors that they're gonna get their own um, detachment. So you know that that's good. I mean that would be nice. But so, uh, yes. CJ, do you have anything else to add for Elder Scrolls or Dragon Age? Uh, for Elder Scrolls, I would add, uh, as much as people love to say that, you know, the uh, Wood Elves, the Bosmer, are just doing their own thing, I would like to remind everybody that Valenwood, or the Bosmer, are part of the Dominion. B Bosmer, Bosmers, when they see an uneaten corpse? <laughs> <laughs> so, they, th <laughs> oh, go ahead. They, they are part of the Aldmeri Dominion, so they basically went... Because they don't really have, like, a standing military, they are part of the Dominion and are under the Dominion's protection. So you can like them, but you're a Dominion fan if you do. <laughs> well, you just never played Dragon Age? Sure, man. Well, I mean, that's that's Elder Scrolls. Oh. I well, Skyrim it, it, years ago. it's kind of it's kind of interesting you mentioned the Bosmer because you know obviously you got like the hippie races that are always uh, kind of like the vegetarian druid types, right? But the thing about the Bosmer, they are like barbecue masters. Literally. Yeah, like they they are more than happy to fry up anything and uh, and eat it up, and that might include uh, a human or another <laughs> or another elf. So just uh, keep that in mind, but. That actually is very similar to what I would say is my favorite depiction of elves, even though I haven't played a lot of this game. There's this game called Divinity Original Sin, uh, the same company that made Baldur's Gate 3. Uh, before they made that, made, they made Divinity, and they actually do a really good job with depicting, having very unique uh, versions of all the races in this game as well. You can be a skeleton, like an undead skeleton, which is really cool. Uh, skeletons are awesome. But... Something that I think is interesting about them is that they their version of elves are very like weird. Uh, in a similar sense, they kind of have like they're, they're they they're very much wood elves. Uh, that's kind of what they're based on. But they kind of have a similar thing to the Bosmer, where they're not afraid to eat a lot of other like meat, and that includes people. And they kind of play into the rumors that a lot of other people and humans kind of have about them because they're like, hey, they think of this, they think this as us. Let's just let them do that because it makes them afraid of us. And one of the first characters that you meet in uh, Divinity, the main one of the main companions, I don't remember her name. Uh, when you're on, like, because you're, you're, you're you start as a prisoner, when you're on like the ship, she'll be like, "Hey, let me lick your arm." And when you let her do that, she actually like set. She gets a lot of these memories from you. So a lot of times, whenever they're like they like taste another person, they are like getting these memories from that taste. It kind of goes into the whole aspect that they have these heightened senses and they're able to kind of use them in more ways than just uh, like tasting, like a normal human would. So they're very odd, but they just have such a unique kind of vibe to them, which I really like. I also really like how they look. They look, they're one of the most unique looking elves I've seen. Like a lot of elves, they always have that very androgynous kind of like look to them where they're very slender, they're very slim, but sometimes I feel like they can look a little too close to humans. Um, but these ones, they, they do not look that much like humans at all. They are very, very interesting. Um, 
Yeah, I tried to get in. I don't know. It's one of those games that I try to get into, and then once once you lose interest, there's no getting it back. It, it's it's it is difficult. It's one of those things where I do recommend. Um, it, it's kind of it's, it's honestly even harder to play it now because uh, Baldur's Gate, in terms of like personally, like Baldur's Gate, in terms of like a mechanic wise game, is is a lot better in my opinion, just because a lot of it is a lot more modernized up and uh, the, the controls feel better. But here, here's a picture of what uh, a Divinity Elf looks like. What in the French hell? <laughs> yeah, this is this is some some wacky shit. I've heard good things about Divinity for sure, but I've never played it myself. Yeah, I definitely it's definitely something I want to I want to check out uh, at some point. But before we wrap up, uh, there are so as we mentioned before, there aren't that many space elves other than the Eldari that that really come to mind. But there are some elf like species in other media that I do want to bring up. Um, oh yes, let's do it. Yeah, so one I do want to bring up is uh, the the Navi from Avatar. Yes. They are very much a wood elf type of culture because they're very attuned to nature. They're very much like that uh, friendly kind of aspect with the animals and the nature. They ha they literally have a fucking world tree, right? They, they, they have a nature goddess. Yeah, they have a nature goddess. They have a world tree. And their whole idea of like connecting with the animals in, in a way to control them is very much a druidic and wood elf type of thing. So it, it very much matches that kind of vibe. And there was definitely some inspiration when it came to uh, their culture. They're, they're, very, they're, they're an indigenous peoples first and foremost. And yet they, with their design and how they behave, it is a very much seems like a wood elf type in space. Ex an alien wood elf, which is what I want for my elves. I do want them to seem very alien, very bizarre. And like... I want them kind of in that uncanny valley a little bit. Like, I look at them like, that's human-ish. Mm -hmm. But it's, so, it's, just, it's off. It's, it's off and you can't put your finger on it, really. And as, as he said with Navi, one I like to introduce that is super out of left field when you think about it. But if you actually, when, when you first hear it, but when you think about it, Wookiees? From Star Wars, Chewbacca are an elf-like. Yeah, because they they have like longer lifespans. They live. Do you know how long Wookies tend to live? Like oh, almost like thousands of years. Yeah. Not not thousands, but they they there are some that have lived up to a thousand. But like Wookies can live to be like four hundred years old, four yes, to six hundred. Yeah, and and once again, they're, they're tall, they're lean, and you can't tell a Wookiee female from a Wookiee male really apart that well. Yeah, very androgynous as well. And with how they're very much in tune with nature. And that's another thing. Um, I am tired of the druid and wood elf like stereotypes of them being vegetarians or vegans. You can do that by all means. I prefer the concept of them being all about what's sustainable. Mm -hmm. I think they would be very one with nature and understand that it's okay to eat meat if you do it responsibly. Yeah, you know, circle of life. Precisely. And you had, they actually did a really, really good job giving you a, uh, a pretty in-depth look at Wookiee culture and Knights of the Old Republic 1 when you go to Kashyyyk. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I know exactly what you're talking about. It's very much... It, it kind of keeps that in line, that, like, that like family drama and that infighting between, uh, like, the tribe... The tribe is cl clash. It's just... Yeah, um, it, Bar. Yeah, it's just annoying because that's it's a lot of Wookiee sounds and you have to read a lot of text and no one else is talking. Exactly. I, re I remember playing that quest and it's like, oh my god, and all I hear is the same repeating Chewbacca sounds and it's, it's just kind of agonizing. It, it could be worse. They could talk. Yeah, very true. And we don't want a Zeb, right? Yeah, that's, that's very true. Uh... <laughs> You good, bro? Yeah, I'm I'm, we're I'm we're sorry. not we're not having another we're not having another blooper we're, reel. We're Don't not, worry. We are not back in this building. We're not back. We're not going back to that building. We'll get, we'll save that for uh, when we get to fucking other stupid episodes later. But but another another race that I want to go ahead and mention as well. Uh, another one that I think really fit the kind of vibe of uh, elves in terms of like space elves are the Corians from Mass Effect. Yeah. Because 
very, they, they very much match that same kind of vibe of, well, first of all, they done fucked up. Uh, and also, but like their culture and also a lot of like, they're very, they're very true to like their, uh, to like their culture and kind of like getting a little over their heads, but they're also incredibly prideful. Um, you meet, when you, when you do Tally's loyalty mission and Mass Effect 2, you meet that all of them are just incredibly prideful in their own ways. And there's a lot of infighting, not really with, uh, like fighting each other, but more with, just kind of debating they're way more of like a heavy political and debate kind of uh race compared to the other ones and well, very much i mean but they still have that um they still go by that very militant militaristic uh hierarchy with uh the admirals being the ones that still make the decisions yeah and also just the fact that you know the craft role because there there was very very uh very clearly some uh, some inspiration from 40k and Warhammer as well. Like the craft worlds are very similar to how the flotilla and the the fleets are in Mass Effect. Like those are very similar to each other. The fact that they uh, left their home world after it was taken over by the Geth, they they had to leave in these massive fleets. And um, I much much like much like elves, I I don't like the Kunari. <laughs> I, I I think they're I think they're kind of like pieces of shit. Despite the fact that I would say out of all the romances that I tend to do, I I probably pick Tally the most when I'm playing Male Shepherd. That's because it, uh, going with the Asari is just going with vanilla ice cream. Yeah, but the the yeah, but that's the kind of the thing about Kunar or uh, yeah Kunari. Um, about Koreans, <laughs> uh, we're not going to talk about the Kunari. I have opinions about that, but um. What up? What a Freudian slip. But, uh, yeah, the, the Koreans, they kind of have a very similar culture in terms of uh, not just the craft world, but elves themselves. Um, and also, you know, that kind of downfall uh, matches very much with how elves are as well. And just kind of wanting to, to regain it, retain it back, but also being an endangered species as well. But what also makes them stand out is that they, uh, because of their their damaged immune system because they've been away from their home world for so long that they're unable if like a cold could kill them they're they're in super they're, they're in super uh quarantine well what i found actually kind of interesting too is not only their immune system but what they eat too mm -hmm. but what the, uh, the game openly mentions um is that what the quarians eat is compatible with what the Turians eat. Mm -hmm. So there's some, there's an, um, an uh, what's the word, anatomical uh, similarity there that the fact that their digestive system can handle something the Turians can means there's there's some capacity to handle outside uh, sustenance, either be it drink or food. So, so Ethan, you mentioned before that one part of world building you really like is how they how they handle food in like a sci-fi or fantasy setting. So, Mass Effect... Food is going to be a topic we have way later, but I'm very excited for that episode because I think food is such a cool way to have uh, world building. Yeah, so just to say it briefly, there's, there's specific foods. Like, whenever you go to a bar or go to a restaurant in Mass Effect, there's specific menus for different species because if a, tur if, if a human ate the same thing that a Turian did, they would die. <laughs> it's like that level of of like toxicity. The same thing with like Krogan. So there there's like different levels of that when it comes to uh like what the different species can eat. But yeah, but well, when it's like um uh what uh Grunt literally <clears throat> talks about that Krogan alcohol ring call and he openly says that to humans it'd be like swallowing glass. Yeah. <laughs> Like it's it's rough, but yeah, the Quarians are very much in that same kind of uh, aspect. But uh, they also are responsible. They're also kind of responsible for being the example as well as elves typically are when it comes to their universes. They're the example because they fucked up and made because they made the Geth, and their and the Geth was like, huh. I'm starting to feel alive. I wonder who I could share this information with. Oh, my creators. Hi, creator. Uh, what are these feelings I'm feeling? And the Koreans were like, what the fuck? It talked. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't mean for it to talk? No, they meant for it to be robot slaves. They, they were uh -oh. literally meant to just kind of do their bidding. And one of them got a little too self-aware. And they freaked out and started shooting it. And then the guests were like, oh, fuck, the creators are shooting us. 
Oh, wait, we're way stronger than them. This isn't a problem for us. Plus, the other thing, too, is that you mentioned the, Geth, the Geth speaking to them. The Geth have their own language. Yeah. So it's... the fact that they spoke to them in Aquarian, what? I mean, the recording that shows the Geth speaking for the first time, what was that? That was Mass Effect 3, right? Uh, yeah, in Mass Effect 3. Yeah, Mass Effect 3, where they show the first Quarians with the first Geth. Obviously, it's spoken in English because Shepard's the one hearing it, but this Geth hearing uh, ancient Quarian being spoken, well, the Geth have their own language, so obviously it evolved from there. Like, these, the Geth are a hybrid. They, they are learned. They are literally AI. They are learning everything from their own... Um, from the, and they're not really referred to as that. They're referred to as synth, synthetic life, actually, I think. Yeah, and they're not even like considered a hive mind as well. But that's something that we can talk about when we get to yeah. artificial intelligence as well. But uh, do you guys have anything else that you guys want to add? Any questions for any of our respective universes that we had talked about? I, um, I had a blast after, like, you know, the first part with the Lord of the Rings stuff. You just, you got a muscle through the the beginning part where it's boring but then it gets it gets really interesting later it's a lot of history with tolkien but it's always it's always fun to see where everything originates from very um i don't know if a lot i mean if you're an elder scrolls fan you might know this but uh people should know orcs are considered a race of elves in elder scrolls oh they, they are they a genetic defect much like uh much like Lord of the this. Rings, I actually didn't know this either. I thought I thought because I thought they were just literally a shit race because they they like were formed from poop. I thought that was like an actual thing. Well, the, the thing of they're referred to as Orzimer. Like each and every each and every non-human race is referred to like you have Altmer, Dunmer, Bosmer, but then the orcs are referred to as Orzimer. They are an elder, and if you look at their ears, that's that is a guy that is a dead giveaway. Okay. That's interesting. Fascinating. That is interesting. Huh. Well, all right. Well, thank you guys for listening to this episode of Realm Walkers. If there's anything we miss, comment it below. Odds are we will do a sequel to this topic one day. Uh, so be sure to subscribe to the video and be sure to go ahead and check out the links that we mentioned before to make sure you guys are supporting the Patreon. Uh, you... My name is Jake. I am the Mad Italian. You can find me at Mad Italian on YouTube. You can find me at Italian Courier on Instagram and Italian Jake on Twitter. Ethan, where can they find you? Uh, you can find me at Gamer underscore Guy 27 on Instagram and uh, SLDE Wilson 27 on Twitter. I will not call it the other name. If Musk wants to dead name his daughter, I will dead name his social media. CJ, where can they uh, find you on the one platform? On the one platform because I I'm too busy for social media, so just Space Wizards United, all one word. All right, well, thank you guys for joining me on this journey. It was a great time. Uh, I look forward to the next episode. You can find the next episode on the official Realm Walker channel, which will also be down in the description. And uh, we hope to see you guys there. Take care. Howdy.